In this video, we are going to look into two giant companies that are fighting over the way people communicate. It's Red vs. Blue, AT&T vs. Verizon. We are going to look at how they got started, how they differ, and what they're planning to do in the future. For the 718th time, we present Camaro vs. Mustang. Many of us rely on them to get around, and I always wonder, you probably do too, which one is better? It's just one offensive in its battle with rival Pepsi for hearts and taste buds. Before we start getting into it, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos. AT&T's roots go all the way back to the invention of the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell, with the exclusive patent for the telephone, started the Bell Telephone Company to begin building infrastructure to utilize his new invention. To quickly expand, they gave out license agreements to whoever wanted to open up a telephone exchange. These telephone exchanges were where the operators would physically connect your calls. This agreement was a great way for Bell to expand its infrastructure quickly, while also still having control over the entire thing. As they began to expand their local operations, they started looking to connect long distance lines. They acquired Western Electric, which was a manufacturing company, which made them the equipment to start making long distance lines. In 1884, they built a long distance line from Boston to New York. For their long distance lines, in 1885, they created the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, or just AT&T. Eventually, AT&T became the parent company of the entire business. Before all this, AT&T had the exclusive patent for the telephone and the telephone business. But in 1884, the patent expired, and a flood of competition came in. This, however, gave them a huge start in the telephone business and most notably the long distance business. Many smaller companies faced huge barriers because AT&T had a stronghold on the telephone infrastructure. However, AT&T was so big customers felt like they were being price gouged and the company actually started having a really bad public image. AT&T also focused just on major urban areas and many rural areas still did not have any telephone line. AT&T continued expanding through the years and buying up smaller competitors and operating business. During this time, they also created Bell Labs for their R&D. Bell Labs created many inventions that shaped our modern world, such as transistors, solar cells, and even some programming languages that are still used today. In 1910, they bought up 30% of Western Union, who at the time was one of the biggest telegraph operators. They were growing too big and were creating a monopoly on the communications business. The government stepped in and settled with the Kingsbury Commitment. This agreement said that they had to get rid of their stake in Western Union and had to allow independent companies to utilize their long-distance lines. Many thought that this was not enough and people started calling it a government-approved monopoly. In 1920, the government continued protecting AT&T's monopoly by passing the Willis-Graham Act. This pretty much exempt telephone companies from the Sherman Antitrust Act. At this point, there were 14 million phones in the United States and 9 million or 64% were controlled by AT&T. By the 1980s, they controlled 83% of all telephones in the United States, 98% of long distance lines, and owned Western Electric, who made 90% of all telephone equipment. In 1956, with the government breathing down their neck for being a monopoly, AT&T agreed that it would limit using Western Express for some of its equipment. The bigger thing, though, is that they agreed just to stick with telephones and not venture into other industries such as computers, which they already had the infrastructure to do so. For the next 18 years, they continued to dominate the telephone industry unbothered by any competitor or the government. In 1982, the government finally ruled that AT&T had to break up their local businesses, but now they were able to get into the new computer industry which they wanted to do previously. So they took all 22 local companies and split them into seven regional Bell operating companies. These were referred to as Baby Bells. This is where Verizon comes into the mix. In 1997, one of the Baby Bells, NYNEX, acquired another Baby Bell, Bell Atlantic, along with the smaller company, GTE. Upon those acquisitions, Verizon was formed. That's where right, Verizon actually came from AT&T. Soon though, SBC Communications, which was a baby bell, acquired Pacific Telesis and Ameritech, which were both baby bells. The merging of these baby bells eventually bought AT&T itself, and that is the modern AT&T we know. I know it sounds kind of crazy, how can a company that got broken up be bought back by the smaller companies it was broken up into? But during this time, AT&T was continuing to break up and slowly got smaller and smaller. 
While this was going on, the baby bells were acting independent of AT&T and were actually starting to grow bigger and bigger. Soon they got bigger than AT&T and bought them. So AT&T is kind of the same company to when it first got started, or at least it has some of the same parts. Let's start diving into Verizon and how they become the largest wireless service provider. Once the baby bells merged together, they won FCC approval to offer long distance and local services. This meant that customers no longer had to use two different providers to make long distance and regional calls. In 2000, they officially acquired GTE for $52 billion and created Verizon Wireless, which soon became the nation's largest wireless carrier. After this acquisition, they hit the ground running on their wireless network infrastructure. They were one of the first to come out with a 3G network, which was 10 times faster than the previous CDMA network. They were also the first to create the wireless phone upgrade plan every two years. So you can blame Verizon for getting a new iPhone every two years. In 2002, they came up with their famous Can You Hear Me Now campaign. That guy is actually with Sprint now, so we'll just gloss over that. Verizon continues expanding its wireless network, even going outside the U.S. to Canada, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. Verizon customers can now make a call from anywhere in North America without any long-distance fees. In 2004, they jumped into the high-speed broadband industry with the introduction of Verizon Fios. They marketed it as a 100% fiber optic network. In 2006, they acquired MCI, which gave them an international long-distance network. This acquisition was actually spun off into Verizon business. They also acquired Rural Cellular to expand their wireless network to more rural parts of the U.S., which still had spotty service. By this time, Verizon started selling off their wired lines to focus on wireless, Fios Internet, and Fios TV. In the beginning of 2007, Fairpoint Communications bought their Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont lines for $2.7 billion. In 2009, they sold off a majority of their wired lines to Frontier Communications for $8.6 billion. With all this new money coming in, Verizon had money to burn because they were acquiring companies for far more than they were actually worth. They first acquired AOL for $4.4 billion in 2015. Then they acquired Yahoo for $4.8 billion in 2017. Fun fact, Yahoo bought Tumblr for $1.1 billion in 2013, but now Verizon owns Tumblr. I just love picturing the Verizon board scrolling through Tumblr trying to figure out what they bought. Verizon actually decided to combine AOL and Yahoo into a new entity called Oath, which was later renamed to Verizon Media. In 2017, Yahoo's core internet business, which was now owned by Verizon, was renamed to Ultiba, which was listed on the NASDAQ as an investment company. Ultiba's biggest name to fame was investing heavily in Alibaba. They were Alibaba's second biggest investor, and in 2019 liquidated their investment, which netted around $40 billion for Verizon. Verizon wasn't the only one trying to diversify during this time. AT&T bought DirecTV for $49 billion in 2015, and the next year they bought Time Warner for $85 billion. This acquisition of Time Warner was met with a lot of pushback from the Justice Department and Donald Trump. In the end, though, they got the acquisition approved. And now AT&T owns Warner Brothers, HBO, CNN, and the whole Turner Broadcasting lineup. If you're making $85 billion purchases, I would say you're doing pretty well overall. We will see, though, how these purchases actually pan out in the future. Will they end up like Verizon purchases of AOL and Yahoo, which are basically worthless now? Or will AT&T finally have the capabilities to stand up to the streaming giants such as Netflix and Amazon? Competition is rising for both AT&T and Verizon, with the official T-Mobile merger with Sprint completing in 2020. This now brings the total major nationwide carriers only down to three, so all of these companies now have a vast network and capabilities to outdo each other. This isn't the time of AT&T dominating the whole communication business anymore. As 5G comes into play, all three major carriers are trying to create the biggest 5G network. AT&T already rolled out what they call 5GE, which was basically just a fancy marketed 4G network, but this just shows you how important it is for these companies to say that they were the first to introduce 5G. Verizon already started rolling out a true 5G network in 2019 for major cities. With the Sprint merger, T-Mobile now has the capabilities to start rolling out their own 5G network. Although it looks like Verizon is going to win this race because they have the most capability and resources to start aggressively rolling out their 5G network and start grabbing up as much market share as early as they can. 
With the consolidation of the major national carriers, it looks like we might start seeing what we did before the breakup of AT&T. Many people worry that AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are getting too big and becoming an oligopoly. This is similar to a monopoly, but the key difference is that a few companies control one industry. This becomes a problem because if you want to start a new telecommunications business, you still have to use infrastructure owned by the bigger networks. There's also no real competition between the three. They often stay out of each other's regions, especially for broadband. Oftentimes in more rural regions, there's only one provider that you can get for internet. If you can't afford that provider's price, then you're out of luck and just won't have internet. In today's world though, the internet is an important part of our lives. From communicating to even finding a job, the majority of it's done online. This problem is still being debated, and some people want the three national providers to be broken up just like they did with the AT&T. The battle for telecommunications is a complicated one, with the breakup of AT&T and a lot of mergers and acquisitions. We started with one nationwide provider, and today we find ourselves slowly going back to that. And with that being said, as always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe to see more.